Hey everyone, welcome to the USAR 2020 tutorial on Disk Frame. My name is Juliana and along with Elki, who is also here today, I organized the Our Lady San Diego chapter. Today we're really happy to host ZJ Dai's tutorial. ZJ has 13 years of experience in analytics and data science. He has a math background and is currently working on a general purpose data science AutoML platform. I'm really excited to hear some more about this awesome package ZJ created called Disk Frame, and I hope you are too. So with that, I'll hand this over to ZJ. Hi, this is ZJ. Um, this talk is titled, You Don't Need Spark for This. Uh, it's about Disk Frame, a larger than RAM data manipulation framework I have been developing in R. So we spend about 80% of our time dealing with data. So it makes sense to, you know, have really good tools for dealing with um, data in R. However, when you look at the um, data ecosystem, not just in R, but um, in general, you see that um, there's data of various sizes. And here I give uh, a definition for uh, data that sits in various data um, size segments. So you have your trivial data, which are basically data that can fit onto your Excel spreadsheets. That's like basically data less than with less than a million rows. And then you have small data, basically any data that fits into the random access memory. Uh, so these data sets can be easily dealt with um, in R, in, in data frame or in Python, like in a tool like pandas. Uh, but then on the other end, you have the big data, which really requires a cluster of computers to manipulate effectively. And the reason why is because this data is so large that, you know, firstly, it doesn't fit onto your RAM, doesn't fit on your hard drive, and it requires a lot of processing time. So therefore, it's better to just um, distribute them. But 99% of the cases, uh, really, you don't really have big data that require you know, a cluster to manipulate effectively. And a lot of the time, your data simply fits into this segment called um, the medium data. And really, it's in the medium data bit that I really want to focus on. So basically, these are data that can fit on your hard drive, but doesn't fit into RAM. And for a long time, R doesn't have um, a good tool to, to, uh, to handle this type of data. And this is where this frame comes in. Um, so this frame is an R package, as I mentioned. It, it really tries to work with data that's too large for RAM, but still fits on your hard drive. So you can use one computer to uh, manipulate them. And traditionally, you know, people will be using things like SAS, or in Python, they use Dask, or there's a new tool called Vex. You know, in Julia, you do JuliaDB. Some people use Spark on a single computer, um, but that's really um, kind of defeats the purpose of Spark, I guess, but it kind of works. Um, so this is what I think of as the medium, ideal medium data tool. It's going to be free, it's going to be easy to set up, it's going to be fast. So um, a lot of people use databases but um, for medium data, but I think databases, depending on whether you're lucky or not, you might be in a corporate environment where it's just not something that you can set up for yourself. Um, so if you're lucky that in your company or, or your workplace that someone has set up a database for you, um, that's really nice, you know, you can query data from that, but that may not be accessible to everyone. Um, so, so this frame tries to be easy to set up as well. Um, and roughly speaking, this is where I see where things really, 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 really sit. Um, so you've got Spark over here, that's kind of like free, but a little bit slow, but actually it's not too bad. Um, SAS is kind of like expensive and slow at the same time. Um, and then you have your disk frame and your task over in this area, so like free and reasonably fast. Um, so how does this frame handle such large data set? Well, it's actually quite simple. We you take a big data set and you break it up into smaller files. Um, so, um, so, and then you store each of the smaller files into um, a folder. And this folder with just many small files and maybe a metadata folder is what I call the disk frame format. Um, so it's as simple as that. And there's a few things that happen when you break up a large data into smaller chunks. Um, firstly, you can process the chunks in parallel using the, the, the many cores on your computer because that will speed things up. Um, when you store your data on disk, if you compress them, um, then you can make sure that you can load 
load the data into memory faster. Um, that will speed up a lot of things. And you can also do things like you know apply some online algorithms so you can operate on the chunks you know more efficiently. So um, I I'll see you if I have time, but I'll might um, uh, demonstrate a use case where we fit a logistic regression with uh, this frame. Um, so really, these are the key ideas of um, this frame. And really, this frame it wouldn't be possible without you know the, the giants in the R world, which are like your data table. Uh, we use future and future.apply to parallelize all the tasks. Um, and we use the FST file format. Um, if you haven't uh, come across FST, it's, it's really great. You know, you can store uh, tables um, in, into really efficient formats and make them easy to load, fast to load. And it's got lots of amazing things like you can read um, uh, a particular column from the table, or you can read particular rows from the table uh, without having to load the whole data set into memory. So this frame makes use of FST a lot to speed things up. And of course, um, tidyverse is so popular. You know, I, I, you'll see that this frame you make use of a lot of the tidy, um, tidyverse, um, especially the, the player verbs. And uh, it re really, I, the reason why I developed this frame was when I was working on a big bank. We used to have this big data set, about 350 million rows, about 200 columns. And all I wanted to do was, you know, select some column one from table. That's, I just want to know the sum of something. And it was taking 25 minutes in SAS. So, I mean, after a while I got, I got sick of it and I just developed this frame so that I can break the data set into smaller pieces, access all the data sets, and I was able to do the same task in three, three, three seconds. And the problem with SAS was that um, it's not using all your CPU cores, and it's not taking advantage of the fact that your most PCs now have SSDs. So it's not taking advantage of the fast disk access, and it's not taking advantage of the fact that you have multiple cores, so you can parallelize a lot of your processes. So um, as we go through this tutorial, you'll see that this frame tries to take advantage of, at least you know, the, the parallel processing should be um, obvious why it takes care of that. And the FST is really good at reading data from, uh, in random access, so it's good for uh, random uh, reading data from the SSD on the hard drive. Okay, so that's a little bit about the um, disk frame. Uh, next, I'll go through the disk frame website um, because this contains a lot of very common questions that people um, ask. Uh, it's just diskframe.com. So, um, like one of the some of the common questions, like why why create it? Um, I guess you know I, I don't know how many of you have run into this, but uh, it always comes up with things like you know, uh, error creating a vector of this size. That means your computer has run out of enough memory. So this claim will kind of get around that by letting you handle large data sets that sits on your hard drive. You know, how's it different to data frame and data table? Uh, data frame and data table sits in memory entirely. This frame are, are data sets that sit on disk. So you have to process them um, by loading one chunk at a time into memory. Um, and uh, uh, you know, how, how does this frame work? I'll go through a lot about all the um, deploy R and how, you, how it makes use of the everything in the um, disk frame. I'll show you all the functions like CMAP, how they work, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I'll just go through some of that. Um, and actually, if, you're, if you go to the disk frame website and if you want to learn more about this frame, you can go to the references to look at all the functions that's been defined for this frame. I've written a few articles or posts that discuss various aspects of this frame. Um, you know, uh, if you want to learn more about this frame, just feel free to browse through them and, uh, and learn more that way. Okay, so let's go into the um, tutorial proper. As I mentioned, um, this frame is all about manipulating data on disk and how it works. And so if you have access to the code, uh, which has been posted into the, um, art, into the chat, uh, so basically, you can clone the repository, uh, which is uh, basically uh, this frame tutorial RLAD 2020. And I'll go through the code starting from one, two, three, four in, 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 in that order. Um, and uh, if you want to run through the code um, while, we're, while I'm talking about this, feel, feel free to do that. So what I, how I set it up is on the left is my R Studio where I run through the code, and on the right is basically the result of running through the code. So then we can just talk about the results if we need to. And there's sometimes some pictures on the right as well. So uh, 
So in order, so basically this frame is on prem. So if you want to install this frame, simply just run install packages, um, and that's it. And I'll be using this um, package called the NYC Flux 13, which contains um, some data sets that I want to use for this tutorial. Um, yeah, um, and the, basically now when you, so when you run, uh, actually I'll show you what actually happens when you, when you run this frame. Um, so for example, if I, um, oh, I don't think I've loaded it. So if I run library this frame, it'll print out a bunch of messages and you see that there's some messages that I've um, printed out in color. Um, so basically this tells you a few things. It says we're using one worker with this frame. If you want to use multiple workers, just run this. So uh, as I mentioned, this frame tries to parallelize a lot of the, the process. So after you do a library, it's highly recommended that you just run set up this frame function. Because what that will do is it will set up multiple R sessions in the background for you. Um, so then every time you run the disk frame uh, operations, it will try to parallelize them. So for example, if I, if I, if I run this now, um, it will go through, uh, look at how many CPU cores I have on my computer and it makes available as many workers as there are CPU cores. So now I have six workers that I'm working with. If I go to the task manager, uh, what you see is that, uh, you know, if I look at the R, oops, you see that I have, you know, at least um, a few R sessions opened up like this. Uh, you know, you, you see three here and you see three below. So I have a total of six, should be. Um, so that's, uh, so that's what set up this frame does. It sets up a few R sessions. Some of them are in the background. And so that, you know, when you tell this frame to run something, you'll make use of all those cores. So that's what happens when you um, library a disk frame. It will always tell you to set up this frame first. Um, and uh, there's another setting that it will tell you to do, um, and that's really optional, which is this one, option features global max size. So the R workers, they need to talk to each other. So what this option does, if you run this, is that it says allow uh, unlimited amount of data to be sent from worker to worker. Uh, that can, could be good if you're really dealing with really large data sets but uh, you may want to just not set that initially just, just to test out your algorithm because um, it, can be, it can take a long time to pass lots of data between, um, between the um, different sessions. Uh, yep, okay. So this or the boilerplate that I want you to, to do, it's really, really simple. Um, just do set up this frame and that's it. Um, actually, one thing I will show right now uh, is that when you do set up this frame, if you kind of like, feel like you should have something to look at. So you can just set GUI equals to true. And if you have, if you have Shiny installed, it will open up the, this um, settings page where you can just play around with all the settings. So currently there's only two settings in, in, in this frame, but um, as I more, add more and more settings, you can just um, open up the GUI. So you can set the setting using the GUI instead. Um, so for example, I can set the workers to four or six and then close it and that, that should be, that should be um, the same, same thing. So, uh, you can set GUI equals to true to show, to show the graphical settings. Um, okay. So that's, that's what I wanted to do, talk about in terms of setup. Uh, you really do want to have multiple workers if you want to take, make, take advantage of the fact that um, you have multiple CPU cores. So uh, I highly recommend running set up this frame every time you use um, this frame. Um, okay. So let's go to the, go to the basics. Now, how do you go about using um, this frame. So this is the, this part. Uh, and I'll, what I'll go through is the, on, on the, if you go on the web, you see that um, there's a, in Spark, they have a tutorial for manipulating this data set. And in the Playa, they have a tutorial for manipulating this data set. And basically this is just me replicating that tutorial. Um, so, so that we, we get, um, we can uh, uh, show that the, the functionality, how they are similar. Um, so as I mentioned before, you library this frame once you install it and set up the disk frame. That's just uh, what I've shown before. And they will set up multiple workers for, for use with this frame. Okay. Uh, so how does it, how does it actually, how does it actually work? Well, basically disk frame requires you to store your data in the disk frame format, as I mentioned before. And the disk frame format is nothing but 
a bunch of uh, FSD files. So, uh, so what I have done here is I've done a library or the all, all the libraries I need. And the first thing is I create a temporary path. Um, so just a temporary path in the temporary directory. So it gets deleted once I close R. And this is the fun first function I'll show you how to do. Now inside the flight, uh, inside the uh, just to make it clear, inside this package, there's this data set called flights. And all that I'm doing is converting this data frame into a disk frame. Uh, and you know, I'll tell it, because as I mentioned, this frame is on disk format, so you have to tell it where to save the outputs. And uh, I'm just setting overwrite equals to true because um, I've done this before, so I, I, I want to overwrite it. Um, so you just run that. Oops. I'm kind of expecting uh, this to show. I don't know why it's not showing. Oh. Okay, but um, I'm kind of confused now because um, hmm. when I run this, it usually show the, shows the result at the bottom. So I don't know why it's not showing at this time. Oh, that's interesting. I never had this happen to me before. But anyway, uh, maybe I just, uh, oh, it could be because I have turned the settings off. Okay, I don't know. okay maybe, I, maybe I run this. Um, make sure I run all the chunks just so that I get all the settings correct. Oh, it's still not showing. But anyway, um, if anyone knows what the issue might be, maybe let me know in the chat. Ooh, I'm pretty sure I tested this, but um, anyway, if you if that did work properly, when you when you um, run that, when you convert something to a disk frame, this is what you will see. Uh, if you type it, it will tell you that where the disk frame is stored. It will tell you how many chunks there are. No printing results on the yeah. It's kind of weird. Mm, yeah, it's not printing online as well. Um, I'm kind of wondering why that might be. Mm. Okay, same same result as me. So, um, but um, it seems to be printing for the the other one. So I don't know. Maybe that one was the setting was off for some reason, um, and I can't tell. And I can't actually tell why that might be the case. Show code and output. Apply. Run again. But anyway, um, it, it doesn't matter. I, I, oh, I'm just trying to print. I'm just trying to print out this one, which you can see on the right hand side here. Anyway, uh, so that's what you should see. Uh, it will tell you how many rows there are and how many columns there are. And I've implemented a few convenience functions for these. So, given a disk, um, a disk frame, if you want to know how many rows there are, uh, the end row will work, and the end column will work, just like in base R. It will just tell you how many columns and rows there are. It will tell you where the where everything is stored. Um, so, so if you go to um, if you go to this one where I just run a directory on the output path, uh, what you should see is yeah, it prints out that oh, you have six chunks and these are all the file names. And of course, the directory just prints out the the list of files that's in the directory. Uh, check output. Okay. Um, Uh, I have a comment saying check the knit button, the configuration icon beside the knit button, not beside it. Oh, configuration icon. Uh, yeah, so chunk output in line. So that should do it in line. Hmm. Well, anyway, it seems to be not only only not working for this one particular um, cell. So I just skip that cell. Um, it seems to be working um, here, for example. So I'll just uh, ignore that for now. Um, Okay, uh, so yeah, so if you, you know, if you recall, this, this is where I put the output and it tells me there's six files in the output. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, if you don't know about FST, check them out, they're really great. One of my favorite R packages, um, you know, uh, it makes, you can load data sets so, so quick, you know. So let's, let's to show you how this uh, FST works, basically when you can save data frame as an FST file, so what I'm doing now is I'm using the FST package to read the FST file. And if I run that, what you see is that 
it, it just returns um, it just returns um, you know uh, a data frame. So I give you so if I do print type uh, actually class. Um, if I print the class, you see that it's a data, um, data frame, and the result is this. So that's that's as basically all that there is to this frame. It's just a bunch of data frames saved as FST for fast read and write. And you can actually directly access these FSTs um, as if they are just um, stored data frames. Um, and the, the numbering system is just, yeah, one, two, one, two, however many chunks you have. And that, that's basically all that there is. Um, and this frame just applies, just allows you to have some functions on top of that to, to manipulate these chunks uh, very efficiently. So I'll show you how to do that. Um, as I mentioned, each file is a quarter chunk. And uh, you know, we try to work with multiple chunks in parallel, one of the secrets to, um, to this scheme. So if you think about that, a lot of the um, deploy operations like filter and mutate, you know, there's no reason to work with one chunk at a time. You know, if you filter a chunk for using some criterion, you might as well filter them in parallel and combine the results together. Uh, it's no different to doing them one by one. By one. So obviously, filter and mutate can be um, operated on in parallel. Um, and certain group buys and summarize can be done in parallel as well. I'll show you how to do group buy a little bit later on in the tutorial. Uh, definitely get to that. Okay. Um, so let's look at uh, one example. So this is how you would go about um, filtering filtering for the year 2003. Oops, this is correct, incorrect code, of course. Um, so if you recall, I've converted the flux um, data, data frame to a flux disk frame, and I'm just applying the plier code here um, to filter it. And you see this collect here. Um, collect is very important. So this is exactly the same if you have used um, Spark. Uh, so you know if you want to uh, actually get the data set back as a data, fr data frame, you need to call collect. So that's the purpose of this collect here. And I'll go through what will happen if you don't have collect uh, as we go through the tutorial. But obviously, this, you can just run this. Um, it'll just work. It'll just, it'll just look at this data set, filter it for this, and return the results back into the um, back into the back into the the session. Oh, okay. For this cell, it's also not printing. Hmm. Oh well. Uh, oh, I think I know what might have happened. It could be because this cell was not um, was not um, runnable before, so it kind of retains that setting. That's why I assume it's happening. Uh, okay, but. Maybe keep it not runnable for now, um, so I can explain the concept. It's the same thing. So uh, the way, the best way to think about how this frame works is when you run this, it actually translates it into something like this. So maybe if I show it over here, that's actually um, a lot clearer, easy to read. Um, okay. So when I run this code, what actually? Uh, so yeah, double equals here to for checking equality. What it actually does is it loads all the all the files on disk. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it reads all the files, and if you're familiar with future dot uh, apply, uh, so basically how future l apply differs to normal l apply is that it runs everything in parallel. So Whereas L apply just runs over the files um, sequentially, so that's the only difference. Um, so, so I run this in parallel. What I what I run in parallel, I, I literally just run read the FST in parallel. Um, you know, and uh, not only that, um, I think this is kind of in inaccurate. So I run this in parallel. What I also do is for each chunk, I just do this filter. And I just return that, you know. Um, so currently, that's that's kind of not 100% correct. And what do I then do if I run this and filter it? Well, I just combine them together, you know. So there's there's four different ways to combine. So I make sure everyone, uh, you know, is uh, is covered. So if you like base base R, you can combine them together using R bind like this. 
if you prefer data table, it's the same as calling our bind list. If you prefer deploy R, it's the same as calling bind rows. And if you prefer per, it's exactly the same thing. It's just, you know, combine this together and uh, call it. So, so the, the, the mental model for this frame is really, when, when I run this over this frame, think about it in, in this frame where it goes, it applies the same operation to every chunk and then combine other chunks for you. So that's, that's what this frame does. It just translates that into this. Obviously, you much prefer to write this than write this. But in, in a nutshell, that's what this frame does. Just uh, runs everything in parallel and then combine the results. And of course, if you're interested in the number of workers, uh, you can just type, you can just type this, uh, future number of workers. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this frame just uses uh, future in the background. So any options that you, that you run that affects future um, will also affect this frame. So in this case, on my computer, I have, I have six workers, um, and that's how you can figure it out. And as I mentioned, if you want to change the number of workers, just you know, change it to whatever number you want. Um, now, some people have told me that set up this frame is, is a bad idea for if you run on a server with 100 cores, because that will start 100 workers. So maybe on a, on a server, if you don't want to hog all the resources, maybe you can just try to be prudent and you know, put eight instead of 100. Um, but, but normally, I just run setup workers, and, and uh, it'll just bring up as many workers as there are CPU cores. So in my case, there will be six. So that's how you find out. Okay. So I've talked a lot about roughly how this thing works. Now I go through, well, you know, great. You have a, you have a data frame, you convert it to a disk frame, but normally if the data set is large enough, they will pass you the data in some form, in the form of like a CSV or something or some other format or maybe a database. Um, so, in the section three, which is the next section, I'll talk a little bit about data ingestion techniques. But um, I guess the most common thing that you can do is, um, um, yeah, take a CSV from someone. Uh, and this CSV could be really, really large. So I have, I have examples where uh, I have read like a 20 gig CSV using uh, this frame, uh, no, no problem. So, so I'll, I'll go through some of the tricks that um, this frame does to allow the user to read really large CSVs. So anyway, Roughly how it works is basically, you know, you, all I'm doing here is I'm just taking the flights um, data set and I'm writing it out into a CSV uh, location. So that's where I keep the CSV. And, um, uh, and I, I define where I want my disk frame to sit. Um, again, I put it into a temporary directory. And this is all I'm doing. So I, I provide a function called CSV to disk frame. And it's pretty obvious how to use it. You just tell it where the, CSV is, you tell it where you want to store the disk frame, and I just put overwrite equals to true because I've done it before, and I want to overwrite the previous results. So again, you just run that. Uh, so uh, actually, maybe, maybe my setting my setting is completely off. I need to restart this you know, later. Um, but yeah, but if you if you did run that, that's that's what happens. Yeah, it just reads the CSV, tells you where it is, uh, exactly as before. Uh, nothing, nothing new there. Um, okay. Um, this, I won't talk about this function. It's called zip to this frame. So if you have a lot of CSV file zipped inside a zip file, um, you can call this function and it will basically unzip the file and convert every CSV in there to a disk frame. Um, but uh, you can look at the documentation for that. Uh, I won't go, I won't cover this, but um, it's kind of pretty obvious also how to use it as well. Okay, so now that you, you know, we'll talk about ingesting data a lot more later on, but roughly you just call this function and it will read it for you. Uh, actually, the other thing that can happen is if your data is really large, like really large, you want to read the CSV um, like a little bit at a time. You don't want to read the whole CSV because that will max out your memory. So you can just set this, um, set this option called in chunk size equals to this. Um, then you can read, in this case, read the CSV 100,000 lines at once. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So if I, okay, so the, the flight DF, just to 
um, clarify. This is the correct printout. It doesn't print the content of the disk frame at all. So I might have to add a feature where it prints a little bit of the CSV, uh, the content, but what you, um, so this is the correct output as intended right now. So if you want to see a little bit of content of the data frame, you can, a disk frame, you can just go ahead uh, and you'll print out the head or you can do a tail. Um, both of these functions work. Um, but currently it doesn't automatically print out, doesn't automatically print out a, a glimpse of the data frame, which probably it should. Um, I just haven't uh, put that feature in there yet. Um, so it should print out a little bit. Uh, but this is the correct output. It just tells you what it is. It doesn't show anything else. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what we have here is basically, uh, as I mentioned here, uh, if your data is huge, you, sh you can think about setting this parameter. But actually, what actually happens behind the scene is um, this frame will try to be smart. You look at your data set. And if it thinks the data is too big, it will try to guesstimate. It try to guesstimate a, a number for this, you know, and it will try that number. And if so, basically, all you have to do most of the time is just run that without specifying a chunk size. But of course, if this fails, uh, you should just go back and set the chunk size. Uh, but from my limited testing, I say limited because I only tested on a few big data sets. Uh, this works pretty, pretty, pretty fine. Um, uh, without it, works fine because um, this frame estimates what is the chunk size for you. Um, so you usually don't have to do that. But anyway, uh, okay. So let me try to make this a bit smaller. So actually, maybe go through it on this side. So now I'm up to running the deployer verbs uh, on this frame. So uh, uh, so this is the the corresponding section here. So if you just scan through this code, uh, you see that I'm taking a disk frame, I'm filtering it, I'm selecting column, I'm mutating it. And once I'm happy with it, I just collect, it's collect to collect the data into memory. Uh, of course, if your data is huge, you probably don't want to do collect, but this is for demonstration purposes um, for now. I'll show you how to deal with larger data sets later on. And uh, once you collect it back in the memory, you can use you know, whatever um, deploy up because once you collect the, the data becomes um, becomes a data frame. So that's actually that's that's pretty normal stuff. Just just deploy up and collect, which you probably have seen if you use things like uh, Spark. Uh, yeah. But this what's this curious thing up the top, you know? It says um, I read this as source keep. Um, a source keep month, day, carrier, deploy, airtime distance. So what source keep does is it says, well, the rest of your code only makes use of these uh, columns. So why don't I just only load these columns into memory? Uh, so I guess a common question I have is, well, how is source keep different to select? So source keep is different to select in that it only loads these into memory, whereas if you call select, it loads every column into memory and then filter it down to these columns. So where possible, use source keep as a first statement to tell this frame that, hey, don't load every column into memory, only load this. So this way you can cut down massively on your memory usage. Uh, and that's actually one of the key features that um, allowed by this frame, uh, FST, because FST lets you load only the memory you want into memory. And if you do that, your program is going to be a lot faster. Now, a potential future work could be that we make this frame uh, work so that you know it analyzes this piece of code and figure out exactly what columns are used and implicitly do this. So you don't have to do it. Uh, you don't have to do it manually. But for now, uh, we don't. I haven't implemented that. So the, the, my advice is, if your pro, if a program takes a long time to run, think about using source keep to only load the columns that you need into memory. Uh, but apart from this, everything else should be familiar. You can just do um, a lot of the deployer verbs. Um, and uh, one of the things that you should see now is, what I should do now is explain the concept of laziness. Uh, so you see, I have broken up this thing into 
this part and then a collect and then something else. Uh, so these frame operations are lazy by default, okay? So which means that when I just run this, it hasn't actually done anything except store in memory uh, the fact that you want to run this. Um, so I'll show you what I mean. Um, so I, what I'm doing here is basically, uh, oops, maybe it's a bit too large. So yeah, maybe like that. Okay, maybe I make it a little bit bigger just so that the indentation is not too annoying. So what I'm doing is I'm timing the first bit. This is the first bit of the code before I run any collect. So if I run that, you should see that it only took this, this much time. So no time at all. Um, but that's because it hasn't done any computation. All that it's done is it's taken, uh, it's taken these and store them as instructions. So let me actually run that. Uh, you see that it takes no time at all. And I'll show you the internals of this frame a little bit. Just So if I look at that and I go, what's the attribute of this guy? Um, the lazy functions. Oops. Let me see again. Oops. Oh. I kind of forgot my attributes. Oh, sorry. Of course, it's like that. Lazy functions. Yeah, there we go. I kind of forgot uh, what I was doing. Uh, anyway, so when you run a program without collect, you, you see that uh, in the attribute called lazy functions, it stored a bunch of things, like all of these things. But all of, all of this information, what it does is basically just says, you want to, I'm going to remember what you want to do in, uh, in, in this, um, all of this structure. But it hasn't carried them out yet. It says, this is what you want to do, but I'll carry it out when you actually call collect. So, so that's this extra attribute in lazy function that stores all of this information. So that's why this takes no time at all, because all that it's done, it just store this information into this lazy function attribute. Um, so what happens when you call collect? Also, it doesn't take that much time, but you can see it's taking a long longer. When you call collect, it actually carries them out. You know, so that's why it takes a little bit longer. Um, like that's actually where the computation happens. Um, and as I mentioned, once you, you call collect, it's back, brought back into memory. Um, Okay, so I'll, but basically, you know, if your data set can fit into memory, there's no reason to use this frame. Um, so all of that was just to demonstrate roughly what happens. I'll show you how to actually manipulate data on disk in the next few sections. Um, but, but this is just to illustrate what's happening, uh, illustrate the fact that this frame tries to be lazy. It only tries to store the instructions in a form, in some form. And then only when you tell it to, it carries them out. Um, that's the whole idea. And uh, this is the list of the plier verb that I've implemented. Um, so uh, actually for the, for the full list, you might want to just check the thisframe.com um, website. Um, and uh, I'll try to answer questions at the end. Um, I see a lot of questions in the, in the, in the, in the um, chat. Um, so support the uh, deployer verbs. Um, so all of these are supported. You see that some of them, I put a chunk in front of it, um, chunk arrange. So normally in deploy R, arrange arranges the whole data set, um, assorts it basically. Uh, so I made a chunk version of it. So what that means is it only arranges it within chunks. Uh, actually, this, this, this actually is not complete. Uh, someone actually contributed, um, contributed a, uh, an arrange function. So actually, as well as chunk arrange, there's also an arrange. So for the updated list of reply verb, check the thisframe.com website. Then you can do chunk group by and chunk summarize, same, same idea. You do the group by and summarize within chunks. But of course, I also have implemented group by and summarize. So group by and summarize without the chunk underscore means do group by on the whole disk frame. Exactly the same as you would um, do on the data frame. And of course, all of these mutate, transmute, a bunch of joins are implemented. Um, for full join, I've said, should be very careful because the algorithm for full join will make it um, a little bit slow. And you'll see the reasons why a little bit um, in the next sections. Uh, I've, I've um, talked about um, 
uh, all of these joins. Uh, very quickly about group by, as I mentioned, in group by, uh, you know, it's you can it's just exactly the same as uh, almost no change. W the the exception is that there are uh, only certain summarization functions are implemented. So in this case, n mean are implemented. Uh, it doesn't implement every single function because um, uh, because when you chunk the data, it's it's actually a lot harder to do group by properly. So a lot of functions are not implemented, and some of the functions are only done approximately. For example, like things like median. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, yeah. So if I want to hammer away the number one takeaway for now, which is kind of annoying, the the, the most annoying thing I could, for this thing right now is that if you want your program to be fast, you have to tell it which columns to load using this source kit function. Um, that's some of those annoying things that hopefully can get rid of in future releases. But yeah, that's the, probably the number one takeaway if your program is slow, just keep only the columns that you need. And as you can see here, actually it doesn't really show in this one too much. But normally what happens is um, uh, for large data sets, uh, I'll show an example running a 1.8 billion rows data set where if you don't do this, the whole analysis could take 30 minutes. But if you do this, it's only one minute. You know, um, it's a huge difference between um, the things. And as I mentioned, you know, you can do joins. Uh, uh, does anyone notice what is the join that's missing in here? You know, I got left join, inner join, semi join, inner join. I don't think I've implemented anti join, but actually I have to try to remember. Yes, of course, the, the join that's missing is right join. Uh, so in this frame, uh, when you do a join, the left table always has to be this frame. Uh, if you want to do a right join, uh, just convert to a left join because we, we just don't allow that. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so this is some examples of running through the um, joins. So if you're running in the notebook, you can have a crack at running it. Um, but roughly speaking, so what you see here is I've taken the airlines data set and I convert it to a data table. Um, actually, I don't have to do it, convert it to a data table. I can keep it as a data frame. It will work the same, but I just want to show that um, it kind of like, it's, yeah, it doesn't really matter whether it's a data table or data frame. It works the same. Uh, this is a disk frame, if you remember. So you can left join a disk frame to a data frame. No problems, right? So the right-hand side table, if it's a data frame, no problem. You can do whatever you want. Uh, and it will just join normally, just like you would. Now, if I do something slightly different, if I convert the uh, data frames table to a disk frame, you know, I convert the airlines table to a disk frame, and I can still do the joins, no problems. It will give you exactly the same results. Um, except, of course, now you should see that um, it takes a bit longer. And also it gives you this warning. And I'll explain this warning. So if you use this frame to um, do joins and you see warnings like this, I want to explain that so that you, you know what, what's happening. Uh, so it says warning, okay? When you do this join, most chunk I, by chunk ID equals to false, okay? This will take significantly longer, you know, and the preparation needed are uh, performed eagerly, which may lead to poor performance, okay? Consider making Y. So why in this case is always the right hand side table because um, if you look at the documentation, I believe you just you should say uh, you know left join is left joining x and y, so um, y is always the right hand side table. So consider making y a data frame or set merge by chunk ID equals to true. But what does it actually mean? What does merge by chunk ID mean? Right. So that's I'll, I'll explain that a little bit. So when you merge two disk frames together. By default, merge chunk ID is set to false. And this is what's happening behind the scenes on the left-hand side. Because each disk frame is made up of chunks, to do the joining properly, it has to compare each chunk in this frame one with each chunk in this frame two. You have to do this many comparisons. So as you can see, there's a lot of comparisons. So that's, that's going to be a lot more computationally intensive. Uh, but if you don't compare every every chunk with every chunk, you can't do the joins properly. Okay, so if you set merge by chunk ID equals to oh this is this is wrong. 
Okay, so so uh, let's let's make that into chunk ID equals to true. Okay, so that's that's not false. This is the case where it's true. Uh, uh, this is uh, okay. So but but anyway, uh, should be obvious. So uh, if you do it equals to true, then they will only match the first one with the first one, second one, first one, third one, third one, and so on and so forth. So a lot less comparisons, a lot faster. So um, that's what this is referring to. Uh, so when you merge by carrier, you know, ideally you should be able to set, set this equal to true. So then you, you have less comparison. But I guess the question is, if you, if you, if you do it chunk by chunk, how do you know that it's doing the merge correctly? So for example, what if carrier A is in both this frame one and two? Then if you just do this view, then this carrier A is not merged correctly. And, uh, and that's what I try to explain with the sharding function. So this sharding is probably one of those um, more advanced concepts that you probably don't use that much often, but it helps when you want to do things like group by and joining. So I'll spend a little bit of time explaining that. Um, I see that we have 45 minutes have passed, but um, I'll, I'll try to speed things up a little bit. Okay. so. How, how does it work? How, what does sharding mean? So if you shard a data, a data frame by column one and two, then what happens is um, all the data sets with columns, uh, with the same values in column one and two will end up in the same chunk. So for example, if I'm sharding by carrier, if I say, take the, take the flights DF and I shard it, and I shard it by carrier, what happens is, you know, carrier A will always end up in the same chunk. I, I probably cannot tell you whether it's chunk one or chunk two or chunk three, but this guarantees that they will be in the same chunk. And, you know, no matter, uh, and, you know, it's, it's always going to be, it's always going to be uh, there. Um, so actually what I should have done, uh, uh, of course, when you want to, uh, to, just to be extra safe, you should do this. Uh, you should do n chunks equals to some number, maybe six. n chunks equals to six. Um, because I'm merging, because I want to do merge by um, chunk ID, I don't want I don't want the two disk frames to have different number of chunks. You know, otherwise I, I have a mismatch. So what you should really do is set. Uh, the example here, set the number of chunks to be equal as well across the two. Uh, if you do that, then I, I will always, it will always be true that uh, carrier A in this disk frame, which is the sharded version of this, you know, will always be in the same chunk number as in here. Um, so that's what sharding does. It's basically, uh, for every value in carrier, it applies a hash function. And this hash function is deterministic. So what that means is, um, you know, it's always going to tell you the same number. And if the number of chunks is always the same, for example, six, then uh, it will compute the hash. And the hash is an integer output. And it computes a modulo of the hash uh, to the chunk number. So, you know, so that's why uh, given the same carrier, they will always end up in the same chunk, provided they, they, they share the same um, same number of um, chunks. Uh, so in this case, if you shard them beforehand, then you can left join and you can set the merge by chunk ID equal to true. Uh, then that will speed it up uh, a lot. In this case, you see, uh, if I sh if I sharded them beforehand and I run them, it only takes two seconds. If I don't, uh, and I just left join the two disk frame together, it takes four seconds. So it's more than double. Uh, this is not such a big problem for this flat data set because it's only like 350,000 rows. But imagine if you're merging, you know, data sets with hundreds of millions of rows. You really want to, you know, have a think about how you want to structure a data set. You probably want to sharp them. Um, and one of the best ways is to sharp them when you're reading in the data. So you don't have to do it later on because doing it here is probably very expensive. Um, yeah, there's a few ways you can sharp the data frame. You can go um, do that and rechunk. Uh, typically speaking, uh, when you sharp them, 
um, the number of chunks doesn't change. It tries to use exactly what was the chunk here, chunk size here to shard them. So if you start with six, you end up with six. Uh, but of course you can set the end chunks equals to something to, to change them. Um, so, so that's why, that's how sharding works. But uh, of course the question is, uh, you know, is sharding itself expensive? Uh, I know that once I sharp them and I merge, they are a lot quicker, but this is very expensive as well. Uh, so that's why typically the advice that I have is when you run a program with this frame and you want speed, you have to really think about how I want to be sharding my data. And typically it's really simple stuff like I want to sharp my data frame by custom ID and the, uh, that's it, you know? So all customers end up with the same custom ID ends up in the same chunk. You know, uh, something like that. So uh, that's that's a little bit of planning you have to put into it, but um, but you will speed up all your group buys and you speed up all your joints if you if you um, apply this shark concept um, uh, properly. But that's uh, that's another performance tip. You know, plan ahead and think about how you want your data to be distributed. Um, you know, typically it's like custom ID, account ID, very simple stuff. Um, do them when you're reading in your data. Try not to do them here because that's that's literally reorganizing the data sets on on your on your hard drive. So if you have a like a hundred gig file, it's a hundred gig worth of data moving around. Uh, so that's that's to be avoided if it can be. But um, actually, the, that's why I love the databases. If you try to re-index or you know repartition, it takes a long time. It's exactly the same reason. Um, it's doing a lot of data movements. Um, so. Same with any other data database system, have to plan ahead a little bit. But otherwise, uh, it's it's fine. It's uh, you can just do whatever you want. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about grouping. Uh, arbitrary uh, window functions. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned before, you can do group by in this frame, no problem. But currently, this is the list of group by uh, summarized functions that's supported. So it doesn't support everything. Uh, I have an article on thisframe.com to show how to add more if you want, um, but um, it's really um, it's it's uh, currently this is the list that's provided out of the box. So for minimum, max, mean, sum, length, n, n distinct, standard deviation, variance, uh, any that's all that's for booleans. These are all so-called exact. Uh, as I mentioned before, anything like into with rank, like median, quantile, you know, interquantile range, these are estimates because it's actually really hard to uh, get the exact median if your data is spread out across multiple chunks. And uh, I get asked this question so, so, so many times that I, I actually did go and research this. Uh, this frame can only give you estimates. I researched Spark. Looks like Spark is also only able to give you estimates probably for exactly the same reason, because the data is actually sharded into smaller partitions or chunks. So it, it can't, it's actually not able to give you an exact median. Um, but uh, I've done some testing. Unless my data set is really strange, I really find, a, find it difficult to come up with a data set where even if I sharded it and I estimate the median, then, I, then my median is very far off. Like It's almost like really, hard to come up with an example where it doesn't work, but I uh, just want to be 100% clear that that's the limitation. Um, all of these are estimates only, they're not exact. Uh, okay, now we provide group by, and we also provide two other group by functions, which I won't talk too much about. And you can uh, go to this frame.com and read some of the examples, but I'll just briefly describe them. So chunk, Group, group by works exactly the same as you would a data frame. So if you do group by group sum, then you, you then you would just sum the uh, uh, mean of x. Then you actually compute the mean, even though x could be sitting in all the different chunks, it will do it correctly. It will compute the mean for you correctly. Now, if you only want to do group by within each chunk, then you use the chunk group by. Now, if you want, if some operations are not here and you really need to have the data grouped by something before you do them, you do the hard group by. And the hard means whatever column you're grouping by, 
say group, it will reorganize the data set, basically sharding it in the background in, into grouping by the um, uh, group by column. So in this example, if I do a hard group by a year, month, day, it will reshard the data set into year, month, day, uh, using year, month, day as the sharding algorithm uh, columns. Uh, and then maybe for some algorithm, you do really want that. But uh, yeah, you have to think really hard before you apply it because yeah, I put the hard in front of it. I guess to warn people that it takes a long time. So uh, and but if you do group by and you stick to these summary functions, you're probably fine, and the performance probably going to be okay. Um, but uh, I won't talk too much about hard group by or chunk group by. Um, but um, feel free to ask questions on GitHub or anything like that. Um, okay, now okay. I guess um, to, to round up all the basics, right? I, I guess a very common question that I hear is basically, okay, cool, you have um, dplyr verbs. What if I want to do something slightly different to the dplyr verbs? You know, I want to do something basically a bit arbitrary. And this is where something like this frame is, is a lot better than things like uh, Spark, Spark R or some other uh, system where you have to talk to the database because the, the key selling point of this frame, one of the key selling points is that you can apply arbitrary R functions onto the, onto the chunks. And I provide two main functions to do that. One is called delayed, one is called cmap. And they're basically the same thing. Uh, cmap is more general. Delay is basically cmap with lazy set to true. So it's delayed is always lazy. Um, so for example, uh, I take my disk frame and I apply the n row function to count the number of rows in each chunk. I guess uh, this will count. Uh, so what delay does is it takes the disk frame and apply this function to every chunk. Uh, for those of you, you may recognize that this is um, um, the per syntax. So yeah, that defines a function. And the first argument to the function is always dot x, and the second one is dot y, etc. Um, so yeah, I'm just doing an n row function. And if I want my uh, results to be returned as a list, and, and I call it collect list instead of collect, um, yeah, so say I have six chunks, and I collect list on n rows, it tells me how many rows there are in each chunk. Uh, so if you don't want to do delayed, you can do cmap. So of course, C in the CMAP stands for chunk. So it applies the same function to each um, chunk. And I set lazy equal to false, then it will automatically run it. Uh, if I set, by default, lazy is true. Um, so if you set lazy equal to true, it doesn't run it until you call collect. Um, same concept. Okay, slightly more complicated examples. Uh, what if I wanted to do, uh, okay, this is actually not correct. So let me put that here. So instead of, uh, okay, if you run map, it will tell you, okay, it's not, not correct. It will, it will give you a warning. Um, uh, it will say that map is deprecated. Please use C map. So I, what I found was that uh, map was a bit confusing. Um, I, I just, C map just emphasized the fact that you're running up over each chunk. So I, I started to deprecate, deprecate uh, map. But anyway, it's the same concept. Uh, C map of this, and my the arbitrary function I want to apply is I want to return the first ten rows in each chunk. You know that's that's uh, that's all I want to do. Um, and I say lazy equals false, and I want to output it to this, uh, and you can just find that. Uh, you know it's it works. So so map and delayed allow the user to specify arbitrary function you want to apply to each chunk, and it will just apply it. But we'll see more a little bit more examples in the section four when we talk about advanced. But uh, roughly, that's that's what you can do. So you can do, uh, for example, uh, examples where I put in some R function like the broom. So in, within each chunk, I fit a logistic regression, and then I use broom to turn that coefficient into a into a table, and I return that. You know, so you can do arbitrary things, whatever you can think of. You can use any R function, any R package you come across. You're not just limited to whatever verb is provided by some other system. So if you deal with the database, you know, if the database doesn't provide its R function, for example, you want to do some text mining, 
when that text mining function is not in the database, you can do it in this frame because you can apply any R function you want, uh, and it will just it will just work. Yeah. Um, and of course, we round out the the the, the, the tutorial uh, for this section. You know, I've implemented the sample fraction, so you can sample a fraction from a, this frame if you want. Uh, and lastly, uh, you can take a this frame and write it out somewhere else. So uh, of course, you don't you don't just take a original this frame and write it out. You probably want to take the this frame. Uh, I'm going to take, take a disk frame, you know, do something to it, like filter, dot, 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 and then do something else, do group by, you know, or whatever, or do something you take, uh, do some stuff, and then you can write it out to somewhere else. Um, so that's one way to store it. Again, I have more examples of that in the section four, okay? So uh, that gives you a good, hopefully gave you a good overview of, um, uh, yeah, good overview of where all the functionalities of this frame. Uh, and, you know, uh, I, I checked my timer. It's, it's just past the one hour mark. And uh, I'll continue for another 40 minutes going through section three and four. Uh, and then we'll leave 20 minutes at the end for, for questions. But um, so far, this is what's been covered. Uh, you know, we, we show that this frame, you can do, you can apply the plier verbs for data manipulation, and I have shown the list of the plier verbs. Uh, please do check thisframe.com. Uh, check the references section to see if your favorite verb is there. If it's not, uh, you know, let me know. Uh, that's how you can do that. Or you can, uh, uh, and we talked about joins, how you can do joins, and how the sharding concept can help in things like joins and grouping. And we talked about how group by and summarizations are possible. We'll talk about more, a lot more about that in section four. And of course, we show that we have implemented some functions like sample fraction and writing our disk frame. Um, and there's a bunch more functions that's here that I won't have time to cover, but please um, do check through them. If you want to learn more about um, disk frame. Okay, so let me take a sip of water. And we're just going to move on to number three, ingesting data. And let me enlarge that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for comment. I've got a comment saying that CMAP is great. Yeah. So that's a whole, uh, I guess that's why, why one of the reasons, CMAP is one of the reasons why some people might prefer um, this frame to like a database or Spark, where in those other systems, you can't really apply all the R functions that you that, that's available in the R ecosystem unless you take a performance penalty. By that I mean you can actually load some data from their database into R, apply the R function, and then transform the R dataset back into the format that they want, and then push it back into their database. Um, but uh, that that translation between a database to a data frame. And then from a data frame back to a database, those two pieces of work typically is gonna be very time consuming because it's actually typically very inefficient to transform your data sets from one from R to the back to the database format. Now there are recently there's things like Arrow that's meant to help with that. But uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see to see how effective those things are. Uh, the good thing about this frame is that there's no translation because as I, as I showed before, all that it's doing is it's loading the FST into data frame format and you can manipulate it using just normal R code. And if you want, you'll save it back to, to FST. So at no point do you have to convert between R and some other system with Arrow or not, because Arrow doesn't even need to get involved because it's just basically R to R. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, I'll show how to do the CMAP without uh, um, per syntax in the, I believe, in section four. Here's some examples of that. Um, yeah, you can define function as per normal. Okay. So I've given you an overview of how R works, uh, how this frame works. And now I want to go over, uh, I guess, one of the biggest obstacles to using any new data system, which is how do you even get the data into that form? 
um, and and you know this one is no different. And what I try to do is I try to provide as many examples or convenient functions as possible I can. Uh, some of them are not even implemented. So for example, I have a a very fast implementation of SAS that converts SAS to disk frame format, and that's not in the disk frame repo. Uh, and in this one, I'll show another function that's not in the disk frame repo um, for converting databases to disk frame. But uh, let me start with the ingesting data. Uh, as I mentioned before, I, I keep showing this. You can do CSV to disk frame. Uh, actually, CSV might confuse some people, but to me, like if you have pipe separated data, fi data files, PSV, or you have tab separated CSVs, all of those I call CSVs. I know it's you know technically not correct because CSV stands for comma separated, but anything pipes separated, tab separated, you throw it into this function, it will just work. Okay, I just couldn't be bothered creating a PSV and TSV function just for that. Um, and uh, actually, uh, disk frame doesn't provide any CSV reader. We just I just reuse the CSV reader from data table, which is every which is the fastest one out there. Uh, it you know, it can reuse the um, reader one. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but so, but why don't even mention data table? So what that means is, uh, in CSV, after the after the the, um, the all the basic suspects in terms of uh, you know input file and out directory, you see that um, there's a dot dot dot. You know, there's an ellipse, ellipsis. Um, you know, you can do this. So typically, anything you put here will be passed to the different uh, readers. So you know, the F read data table, the read R, and the LAF. So yeah, so you can uh, make use of all the functionalities and all the other readers if you know what you what you're doing. Um, okay. Firstly, what I do is, uh, you know, I uh, set up the data table library. And I write the flights data set into a CSV and I read it back as per before. That's just uh, what I've shown before. And I show that once you load it back, you can read the data set. Uh, now, uh, as I mentioned, there's multiple backends that's been used in this frame. Uh, and uh, I have, you know, occasionally people come into the forum. And they say, uh, uh, you know, and they say, oh, your CSV reading function doesn't do this thing, or it's got this issue. Uh, you know, why, why don't you look at that? And I go, okay, cool. This sounds like a beginner issue. Perhaps you could, uh, you could, you could look at it and try to submit a PR. And they, they look at the CSV code and they go, oh, no, that's too complicated. I give up. You know, right? So, so I, I admit, I probably need to do some really Crazy. Uh, I need to do some refactoring of the read CSV code. And uh, actually, even I get confused reading my own CSV backend code, but it kind of just works, you know? But I want to describe high level the logic, what it does. Uh, it tries to do a lot of magic, and the, the logic is, is very convoluted. So I'm going to refactor it at some point. Okay? So this is what CSV, so if you want this going to read the CSV and you call this function, this is what happens. Okay? It looks at the data set. If you think, oh, okay, I can fit this data set into RAM, no problems. Then it will just read F3 and just read the CSV, and that's it. If it thinks the file is too large, like if you try to read like a 100 gig CSV, and you'll notice that um, this frame probably works fine. There's probably no, no, no issues there. Uh, but what it actually does is it uses this big reader package, and it splits the file into smaller files. Okay, so it takes a 100 gig file and splits it into however many smaller files, and it reads the smaller files simultaneously, like using multiple workers. Um, so I've found this to be the fastest approach. So a few, a few problems that can arise. What, what actually can happen? You know, what, what actually can happen? Uh, 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 so, yeah, so my, my point is that. All of these are very complicated. You should read the documentation if you're interested. 
uh, you know, people that haven't used my package say that, okay, I, I, you know, this, this really well documented, uh, you know, I don't know if that's true, but I try to document it as well as I can. So, uh, yeah, so if you spend time reading the documentation, you should be able to um, find something in there that might be useful. There's a lot of things I try to document. Uh, and I probably can't go through all the options because just, yeah, quite a few. And try to read on, on the, the ingest data article on this claim, um, yeah, which you can access here. Uh, now, so my, my point being that, you know, this is just really high level description of the logic. The, the logic is actually a lot more complicated. It's like 10 different things going on. Uh, so you, you should really just, uh, you know, try it out. If it runs to bugs, uh, please report a bug. Uh, otherwise, I try to document all the options, have a look at the option to see if one of them will suit your needs. Uh, and uh, yeah, try to read this ingesting data article. Uh, so to figure out what, what can kind of happen. Um, no, so now if, so in this case, uh, because this is another thing that makes the code really convoluted. So for example, if I take the same flights data set and I write it out as one and two, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, so, you, I, I'm just showing an example where I write the same data set out as one and two, uh, but the, 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 the key point here is not that the data sets are the same, but the fact that I have multiple CSC files with roughly similar columns, okay? Uh, then uh, you can actually just pass in as your first argument, instead of passing the path to one CSV, you can pass it the path to multiple CSVs. And this frame will try to read them and concatenate them into a concatenate them into a this frame for you. Uh, and uh, and this is the output when you run this. Uh, it'll, it's not the output, it's what you see print get printed on, on screen. You know, you just print a bunch of these things. It says, okay, you want to read multiple messages? Please use cold caster to set column types. It minimizes the chance of a failure. So what do I mean by that? And this is actually one of the major pain points with reading CSVs. Because CSV don't come with types. Uh, one of the most common ways I see people fail to load a data set into disk frame is if they have two CSVs that's meant to have the same column and column types, but when the CSV reader tries to infer the types, it might, for example, in column, in the, the first table, maybe it thinks column A is an integer. And then in column B, it thinks column A is actually a, a string because it you know, contains that. And slash A. Then the two CSVs will lead to different column types. And this frame doesn't let you append to this frame with two different types together. Uh, you know, it just, it just wouldn't, it just wouldn't let you. So I, I show you a, a quick, really quick example of that happening. So, so say I have a day A and I want to do as this frame and it's a, it's the most simple data frame that you, you can think of. So A equals to one, two, three. Okay. That's it. So that's, so my A only contains, uh, oh yeah, head, head of A. Okay. So, um, yeah, collect A. Oh, that's it. That's, that's as good as my disk frame is. So I'm going to define another disk frame called B. And all I'm doing is A equals two, but this time instead of one, two, three, I do A, B, C. Okay. So A and B are two different, basically, they have the same column name, but they're, they're different, different column types. You know? So, and the way to Combine two this frame into one is using this R bind list. And I do a list, R bind list dot this frame. And I do a list of A and B. So I try to concatenate them, row a bind, row bind them into one. Uh, it should just, just fail, you know. Can't combine these two because one has integer, one has character. And this is a very common thing that can happen, especially you know, if your, your CSVs are spread out across multiple files. So that's why uh, 
the number of recommendation is set is call classes. So tell this frame what columns there are. Otherwise, the CS, underlying CSV readers may infer different column types for different, um, for columns that sit in different CSVs. And that could, that's the number one, number one issue for causing it to fail. So I, we want to emphasize that because um, that's, that's always the danger with reading CSVs. Um, the column types are mismatched across different files and you'll fail. So this is the way to solve it. Set the column classes using the code classes um, uh, parameter. Okay, and it will explain to you, try to explain to you exactly what, what's doing, you know, it does it in two stages. It's converting the two CSV to six disk frames each, uh, you know, consisting of six ching chunks, and then, you know, that's stage one. And then stage two, it converts the, the row binds them together. So sort of try to explain to you exactly what happened. And it tells you across the two stages how long it took. So, so there's an algorithm behind it. Um, when you try to load multiple CSVs. But, um, uh, I guess my point is that it can be convoluted and, you know, do refer to the help and do refer to the online article or ask questions on GitHub if you run into issues reading CSVs. But otherwise, uh, I guess this is as intuitive as it is to me, you know, just passing multiple CSV uh, files. Obviously, you have to make sure the CSV have the same columns and the columns have roughly the same types. Otherwise, CSV will just refuse to combine them together for you. Okay. Uh, okay. So that's that's about reading CSVs. So I get a lot of questions like, okay, what if I get something other than CSV? Uh, that could be a little bit tricky, and I have to develop more readers. But uh, the function that I recommend everyone to be familiar with, if you have to do custom stuff with this this frame, is this add chunk function. So add chunk is actually really easy. You, you take an existing disk frame, you provide it with a data frame, and you'll add that data frame as a new chunk. Uh, so yeah, so if you already have chunks one, two, three, you call add chunk, you'll add chunk four. Uh, you know, and you can be even more cute than that because, uh, because FST is just a folder with one, two, three. Imagine you can write with a program that that produces the FSTs number one to n simultaneously and just store it in that folder. And that will be a valid display. As long as the columns are the same and the columns are the same type within each of these things. Okay, but for this one, I'll, I'll focus on how to use add chunk to build up a disk frame uh, chunk by chunk. Uh, so this is a bit, a bit of a contrived example, but um, I just want to demonstrate how to use add chunk not necessarily how you would want to do this, because sometimes uh, you may, this may not be the thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a SQLite database, uh, very simple stuff. So I uh, connect to a SQLite database. Uh, I create a table called flights, and it's our friend, the flights data set. And, uh, and the thing that I want to demonstrate is, you know, you can actually use this syntax where you select from everything but limit how many rows you return and provide an offset. So yeah, offset just says, don't start looking until offset n, where n is the number of rows you skip past. So yeah, in this one, skip nothing, read 100 rows. So that, that's, what, that's what you return. And if you think about how you go about using that, you can just go, you can just build up a function where you go, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna figure out how many rows there are in the data table, in the, in the table. So I'm just doing a select count star. Uh, and of course it returns some data frame. So I have to um, obtain the row count uh, in, as an integer like this. Um, and then I just compute a bunch of offsets. Some offsets are starts at zero. And then, you know, if I read 50,000 rows, my next offset is 50,000 and so on and so forth. So I just compute a bunch of offsets to be passed into the offset. Um, column. And uh, so all, all this does is basically like a loop. If you're familiar with per syntax, this is just a loop over the offsets one by one, and it's building up this select, um, select statement. So select from table, order by row number, because I, I, I don't want it to uh, do it some other way. 
And obviously, this is this is a bit inefficient. But as I mentioned, this is just a contrived example to to show how you can load from a much large, large database and and put the content into this thing. Uh, you probably don't want to do this with a proper database. You probably want to do something a bit more efficient. But, but I think that's the idea. So you, you select from this, order by the row number, and you limit how many you return by the chunk size, and you do an offset. So you know, the first time you do it is you go offset zero, so start from row zero, return 50,000 rows, jump to the next offset, which is 50,000, and return 50,000 rows. Jump, jump to the next offset, which is 100,000, and return 50,000 rows. And every time I return a new chunk, what do I do? I just add chunk, add it to my disk frame. And that's all. So, so you can see how I can basically take read data from a much large database and put them into a, a, a disk frame. You know, at some point, I probably should make this into a proper function that's provided by disk frame. But for now, you, you get the idea. And, and, and you know, as long as you have a mechanism to read from the other file, uh, like could be, be it like a parquet file or whatever format, you know, and you want to build up a disk frame, you can build up using add chunk. And in add chunk, uh, there's, there's also a, there's also a uh, chunk ID parameter, which is uh, defaults to null. Uh, so if you don't set chunk ID, you just figure out how many chunks there are in your disk frame and add one to it. So you already have three chunks, you add you, when you call add chunk, you add the fourth chunk and call it 4.fst. And if you, if, you, if you try you to be cute and you try to use the chunk ID and set it as 1 to n and use a parallelized process, you can actually build up a disk frame by using add chunk like, in parallel. Um, so for example, I can do this in parallel and build up my disk frame. As long as I keep track of where, uh, what I should set as a chunk ID instead of relying on this frame to provide me with a chunk ID. Uh, I hope the idea is clear. So yeah, as you see here, I can just call this function and I can build up a disk frame myself, uh, just like this. Um, okay, so, so hopefully that gives you an idea of how you can uh, ingest data into a disk frame in various modes. Uh, if you're reading from a CSV, TSV, PSV, whatever it may be, call the CSV function. Uh, you can even load multiple multiple files into it if you want. Or if you have some really customized needs, try to think about using the add chunk function um, to build up a disk frame. Um, so if you use add chunk, you can do arbitrary, you can talk to arbitrary systems and build it up. So that's the ingesting data section that I want to cover. Uh, and I only have 20 minutes left, and I want to cover this, what's called the beyond basics very really quickly. But actually, everything in Beyond Basics is something you have seen before. Um, I covered in the overall session, so it's like uh, group by and C map and delay. Okay, um, so yeah, nothing, nothing new here, but, but a little bit more depth. Okay, so in group by, uh, uh, as I mentioned, that's just all the boilerplate. Okay, I set up a data frame. Actually, I, I want to run this. I want to run this live. Uh, so this is probably one of the things you can't run uh, live yourself because it's a data set that sits on my local drive. So I've taken this, this data set called a Fanny Made data set. Actually, I might, I might help popularize this, this Fanny Made data set. It's such a great data set. And Rapid AI have very really kindly made it available for testing their Rapid um, GPU system. So if you Google uh, Fanny Made, Rapid AI, you'll be brought to this page where they have, you know, made available the Fannie Mae dataset in a very easy to download format. So you want to test large datasets, um, definitely go to this website. It's, it's like literally you can just right click and download the whole thing. And if you go to the Fannie Mae website proper, you have to sign up and do, you know, a billion different things to get the data. But in this way, you just, you just download it, you know. Um, and, I, and I downloaded this data to test out their Rapid GPU system. Uh, which is like a GPU uh, data frame system, uh, pretty interesting. But yeah, this, this is a really good way to get large data sets to test with. But anyway, uh, actually, I, I got this data um, from, uh, uh, from way before. But you can see here, I've constructed this data frame with 1.8 billion rows, 
about 31 columns. So there's 168 chunks in the data. Uh, so, you know, I can, it's all the normal stuff you can do. You can do head. Uh, and uh, I want to show you this. Uh, I want to do a group by. Group by the month. So that's the month. I want to do a, a bunch of summarizations, like mean of this and the median of this. Uh, I run this. You should see that it takes no time, like one second. And as I mentioned, that's just storing everything. Storing the instruction. It hasn't run anything. Uh, this is where this is so key. Because I, I, I source key, because I'm only using these three columns, I do this here. If I don't do this, this section will be a pain. It will be like 30 minutes. But if I only keep the three columns that I use for my analysis, when I collect on this group frame, uh, it only takes about one to two minutes. So you can see that now it's actually taking serious time. But it's actually summarizing 1.8 billion rows, you know, using a group by. On, uh, on my desktop, which is actually reasonably powerful, but I've done the same demo before, um, yeah, basically at the, at the user with a much less powerful um, desktop. And, and I want to really show you this. So when you, when you run that group by, you can see that all my CPU cores are being used, you know, and you know, memory doesn't get shot up that much, uh, but yeah, but that's why you know this frame is fast because it tries to do all of these group by simultaneously, and do some smarts behind the scenes to com combine it in there for you. So you know you're you, you, you're just doing a group by, and the only annoying thing you have to do is this, but everything else is just familiar to you should be anyway. And give that a, give that a couple of minutes, and it'll be done. Uh, but I just really want to show you live how how much data it can handle um, on a on a computer without having to distribute it over whatever and just have the results return back in about one or two minutes. Um, it will tell you the time when it's, when it's done. Okay, okay so uh, that's all the things, 1.8 billion rows. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, it kind of varies. Sometimes it's 60 seconds, sometimes 80 seconds. And uh, this predicate, yeah, okay. Oh, it's finished running. Uh, okay, 86 seconds, yeah, roughly speaking. So. And you can see the results. It just uh, is exactly as you would uh, get from a normal data frame. I tested multiple times. They, they give you the same results. Uh, just an example of how to summarize large data sets on a, on a computer without having to use Spark and some stuff like that. Okay. Uh, and I even included a picture of the CPU usage, how it's all been used up. Um, and let me emphasize one last time. If you want your program to be fast, Think about using source keep. Uh, if you don't do that, uh, yeah, it's gonna be. Oh, how much RAM did I use up? That's actually a really good question. Let me see. Yeah, as you can tailing off, it actually used about twenty-five mega uh, gigabytes roughly. So typically, and, and actually, the other thing about memory usage, which I actually now I remember, I haven't put it into the talk, so I better quickly explain it. Uh, now you see here, it's got 168 chunks. And if you recall, I have six cores. So what the pro, what this frame does is it loads up six chunks of the 168 into memory at once. Now, if your computer is less powerful, then you can actually just increase the number of chunks. So then you don't use up as much memory. So for example, if you double the number of chunks to 300 and you load six out of 300 something, then you're going to use a lot less memory than 25 gigabytes. So that's the chunking is the mechanism by which uh, this frame helps you manage the amount of RAM that you need. Um, and one thing I didn't mention, and also one of the reasons why the CSV uh, CSV function is so is so convoluted in the way that it's written is that in there you also see a, a section where it goes, okay, your CSV is this big, you have this much RAM, and you have you know. So therefore, and you have this many CPU, so therefore, I think you should cut your disk frame into this many chunks. So it's got logic to try and infer how many chunks that you should cut your data set into. Now for me, because my desktop is quite powerful uh, with 64 gig of RAM, I can cut it into 168 chunks. But for less powerful laptop, you may even double the number of chunks that you, that you do, and, and, and you will still not run out of memory. Um, but it will just, of course, take a bit longer. Uh, of course, the smaller the chunk, the better, because um, 
uh, machines are very efficient in loading like one big file into memory uh, and then running everything from there. Okay, but anyway, uh, memory usage, very important, but you can control it by the number of chunks. And actually, if you, for example, if you've got, if you've got a disk frame from a colleague and the colleague may have a less powerful computer and you've got this out and you say, okay, I want to increase the number of chunks. How do I do that? Just use this function called rechunk, pass in a disk frame. And, uh, you know, uh, so in this case, I have a Fannie Mae disk frame. Uh, maybe like Fannie Mae, like Fannie Mae. So I can use the nchunks function to check out how many chunks there are. And say my computer is less powerful, so I want to do nchunks times two. That's my new chunks, new n chunks. Okay, uh, oh, I call it B chunks, but let's call it N chunk properly. Then you can do Fannie Mae, and then you do re chunk, re chunk, re chunk, and then you go N chunks equals to new N chunks. So, so using the re chunk function, you can basically adjust the number of chunks in your data frame. Um, and that's typically very useful if you move a disk frame from one computer to the next and the computer become less or more powerful, so you can just adjust, adjust the number of chunks this way. Um, I guess, theoretically, I can also provide a function to guess what is the optimal number of chunks, but I haven't done that yet. So you kind of have to take a stab at it, you know, guess what's the optimal number of chunks. But, uh, okay, so that's roughly how it works. Okay, uh, and uh, as I'll try to emphasize this, do source keep, as much as you can. I know it's a bit annoying, but kind of like, to me, that's the only annoying thing, really annoying thing about this frame at the moment. Try to try to improve it in the future. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, uh, group by, you can do all of these functions. Uh, and roughly speaking, if you think about how to do group by if your data set is actually trunked based, you know, uh, the way it does it is basically reduces, so for example, uh, in this example, I'm showing how to do a sum, how to do a sum of n, uh, create sum n, grouped by id, but id a could be in two different chunks. So the way to do that, of course, is you, you in parallel, you summarize the chunks, basically sum up the n's, uh, group by within each chunk, so you end up with this, and then you collect them together into one big data frame, even then, your data frame is still incorrect because A have come from two different chunks. Then you have to do another summarize to make that into the final one. So this frame does all of that for you automatically. But uh, it's only, it only does it for these functions. Uh, and, and if you want to learn more, well, I think we probably don't have time to cover how to define your own. So if you want to, uh, define your own group by function, check out this frame.com. Again, there's an article there called uh, uh, custom one stage group by function. It will explain to you how you can define your own function for, um, for doing this. But basically you have to provide two functions uh, for each summarization operation. And the two functions correspond to the two stages. The first stage is su summarizing each chunk in parallel and then con con concatenating them. And the second function you have to provide is how do you then group this together into the correct form? So yeah, so there's, you need to provide functions that does the parallelization and one for reduction. So if you provide these two sets of functions, you can define arbitrary group by its um, functions yourself. No problems. Uh, some limitations about group by, uh, that's not allowed currently in this frame. Normally this is allowed, but it's not allowed in this frame for now. And why it's not allowed? Because it's nesting a bunch of things. So it's taking the mean of this divided by the max of uh, some other value. This is allowed in normal deployer, but not allowed because you're nesting the max inside mean. So that's one of those things you can improve in the future. But currently understand that, uh, you know, when you do group by, you, you, you probably want to just stick with one level of it. Don't, don't try to nest them. Um, otherwise, your, your function is not going to work very well. Um, yes, yes. The two functions are basically a, a, a much more simplified version of 
uh, reduced. Because currently, the, the all this Spark framework and stuff, they do they do a shuffle, uh, and then they let you do the map reduce eventually. So map shuffle reduce, or some combinations of that. But we can't. This frame doesn't allow you to do the shuffle step, so you can't make the different workers talk to each other. But you can do a, like a map reduce, and that's the only thing you can do, uh, which is uh, much simpler. Uh, okay, so lastly, uh, I want to talk about CMAP. Uh, as I mentioned before, we've shown before, CMAP, uh, you can do arbitrary functions to each chunk. And in the past, I've shown the per syntax, and this is an example where you just pass the normal function. And I like to call my function to take in one argument called chunk. And in this, in this function, right, I'm just doing number of rows of the chunk times the number of uh, number of columns times the number of rows so that I call the number of cells you know and as usual when I call cmap on this it doesn't actually compute anything it just says lazy results so uh, there's two ways I can make it do the computation I can say lazy equals to false in which case it will just return this or I can tell it to say collect list and we'll collect it. Yeah. Um, so you know, take a this frame, apply an arbitrary function to it, and if what you're returning isn't a this frame, uh, isn't a data frame, but uh, if your function doesn't return a data frame, in this case, it just returns an integer. Uh, you're better off calling collect list. Um, so you'll return a list of results. Uh, if you return a data frame, you can just co call collect. In which case, you'll just Concatenate them into um, into a data frame for you. Um, another example, as I mentioned, you can just do uh, I go n cells equals to n column times n row and make a new data frame for each chunk. Uh, and as I mentioned, if you return a data frame, you can just call collect, and it will just concatenate them uh, for you yeah, into uh, into a data frame. Uh, and if you're familiar with per then you know that you see that CMAP is very familiar because I just just took the design from her. And there's some other function that I haven't talked about, which is CI map. So the I means instead of providing a function with one argument, I have a second argument. And a second argument tells me how many, uh, basically just a, a counter that goes from one, two, three, four, five. Um, yeah, so you can do that. Uh, CMAP DFR, so DFR means uh, data frame row bind, so but it's sort of exactly the same thing as CMAP, except you're more explicit about how you treat the um, treat the data frames, um, and they they are basically taken from per. So if you learn about per, uh, when you shift to this frame, they sh these functions should be familiar. Um, okay, very quickly to close off. Uh, so that's that's all great. You can run CMAP, you can collect. I, a lot of the time, I don't want to collect my data because my that's the whole point of using this thing because my data is huge. I want to, you know, do some operation to it and maybe save it somewhere else or maybe just, you know, uh, deal with it some other way. I don't want to, I don't want to collect it. So this is what you can do. You can call a CMAP. In this case, I, I for each chunk, I do a mutate. Of course, because I'm only doing a mutate, you could have done it outside um, just using the mutate function, but this is just to demonstrate what happens. So I want to mutate this chunk and I want to make the output directory this. So if you want to write somewhere else, you have to set the output directory. Uh, I said this is the flight with the flight date. And you have to set lazy equals to false. And depending on what you want, you want to set overwrite equal to true. So for my for me, I've run this multiple times, so I just say overwrite the overwrite the output. Um, so that's how you can apply some transformation. And save it somewhere else uh, using CMAP. Um, of course, sometimes uh, you you don't you, like you don't you don't really uh, you, you want to do something more complicated with CMAP. So in this case, I'll just go this frame and inside CMAP. And in here, I'm using the per syntax. Uh, so in a per syntax, dot x is the first argument. So that's just the chunk. So what do I do inside? I just for each chunk, I'm gonna fit a 
GLM model. And I used the broom package to make the GLM model into a table. And, and you can see this is where this frame is more powerful than other systems because it allows you to use arbitrary R functions, as I mentioned before. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've done that. Uh, and then I want to rename the p-value column and the standard deviation column, and that's it. And you can see here, I haven't called collect. Uh, this one is just, you know, another disk frame. Uh, and then I can collect on it. You can see it brings back the broom, all the, all the parameters on the broom uh, model fit. And what if now, instead of collecting, I want to write this thing to somewhere else. Well, I just use the write this thing function. I just go, okay, instead of um, collecting it, just write to somewhere else. And again, overwrite equals to true. And then we have written this to somewhere else and tell and told you what, what it contains now, you know. Um, or sometimes you don't actually want to save it. You want to save it. You, 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 you just go, I want to apply this mutate. And nothing has happened yet because it's all lazy. Uh, you can just save the lazy data frame as is to a file using the save RDS. And then when you load it back, uh, you can, it will still work because actually what this frame does is uh, it saves this instruction um, in the this frame so that when you save it, the instruction of what you want it to do is also get saved. So, so yeah, so, so you can just save a lazy data frame and, and load it back at any point. Uh, it, it will just work. Uh, and this is just an example of showing it using the QS package to save it. Uh, yeah, exactly the same thing. You, you apply some function to it. Uh, this function is applied lazily, and you can use QF, QS to save it and load it back, and it still works, just like a normal, uh, just like a normal uh, disk frame. Now, this is actually a bit more tricky. So, in here, I do x equals to 100, and in my disk frame, I do departure time is equal to departure time plus x. Of course, the x is this x 100 here, and you and you you know you can see that it's done the computation correctly. Normally, this would be about 517, uh, yeah. and I add 100 to it is 617, so that's that's fine. That's all good. Uh, by the way, you have this get chunk function to get the the the, like the first chunk or the nth chunk, but um, just to get there. So I'll finish very quickly, but the, the point here being that if you use a global variable and you try to save it, okay, you save it and I remove the x. So at this point, x doesn't no longer appears in the global scope. And then I read it back and I look at this, this, this data that I've just read back you see that it's it still does the computation correctly. So, so what um, this frame does is every time you run an operation, if you rely on a global variable, it will try to save a copy of the global variable. So then, so then you don't have to keep the global variable around the next time you you open it up again. So that's another way how it can be um, how how it's kind of like you know it, you you can just save it and and expect it to work when you run it back because all the global variables are captured and then reloaded back. Of course, it's got its limitations. Uh, things like the XGBoost models, which doesn't actually work in the, uh, which you have to save properly for it to work and you just leave in the global variable. It's like, sort of like a, almost like a, I believe it's like almost like a pointer to it in C++, and then, then it wouldn't work. But for simple things like this, uh, uh, actually this frame keeps a copy of it. So it knows exactly what X was when you ran it. The danger of that is you could have global variables that contain a huge amount of stuff. Like you could have a global data frame that's got a hundred, hundred million rows and you save it. And, and yeah, this screen will try to keep track of it. And that's actually really inefficient. So you, you also have to be, you, you also have to watch out how many global variables that you use. But, uh, but otherwise it's generally safe to use global variables in your computation and then save it and then load it back at a later date, and, and you can expect things to work. Okay, we really have to uh, finish this now to leave enough time for questions. But uh, In the Beyond Basic section, we'll talk about group by, we'll talk about how CMAP works. We show more examples of how this frame is lazy by default, um, and how you can use 
things like CMAP and wipe this frame. And you can use things like save RDS and use the QS save to save your lazy data frames, uh, the lazy disk frames, and, and reuse them later on. Uh, and if you want to build a pipeline um, that sort of does lots of operations uh, on the disk frame and then have at the other end, you know, uh, the, the, the prepared data set, you can do it a few ways. You can do it completely lazily and only and save all the instructions in between and then, and then sort of like replay them. Or you can use the write this frame to say, I, I apply all of these operations, now save it somewhere else, uh, and then you know, keep doing the next thing. So you, know, you have a few options there. Uh, okay, I think it's time for Q&A now, but I don't have time to go through a lot of the stuff, but feel free to um, go to GitHub and raise an issue, or go to thisframe.com, or you know, just read some of the articles. And uh, you know, actually, I'm very responsive on the, on the GitHub, so if you have any issues, just raise an issue there, and I'll answer them. And I think it's time to move to the question. Sorry I took about a bit longer than, than usual, but um, yeah. Uh, time for questions. So I think, um, do you want to answer the last one first, DJ, and then I'll privately paste all the questions I compiled to you via chat and you can work through those? Okay, sure. Um, okay. I'll work through the, the questions. Uh, I guess this is the, uh, okay, so let me go from the, the back. Uh, what is my typical use case? Okay, so for me, one of the most useful things for me with this frame is I would take a big data set and just convert it to a, to a disk frame. Then I can do a lot of summarizations, like group by, say I wanna look at the trends over the last 10 months, and I just do a filter and then group by. So I almost use like a, almost use it like a, like a, like a reporting thing where you know, I just, I can do group buys a lot quicker um, using one computer. Um, the other thing that I do is basically just manipulate the, for example, the Fannie Mae data set into a data set I can use for modeling. Um, I typically uh, wrangle the whole data set and then I use the sample frac to sample a, a small enough fraction that I can then use it for other data sets. So I see myself using it as, you know, I build up this huge database, but I call it a database, but it's just a disk frame sitting on my disk. And uh, uh, every quarter when I get new data, I just add chunk to it, add a new chunk to the data, data frame. And I can use the sample frac to sample from it. So I can build like uh, logistic regression models of the data. Uh, so those are my two main uses. One is to, it's like a fast group by tool. The other one is to, it's like a serves at the base for my sampling. Um, and I'm pretty sure on the, this frame, there's an article on how to fit logistic regression using this frame. Um, yeah, so you can fit logistic regression uh, with some with some caveats. Um, and uh, but typically, I don't use this frame direct to fit logistic regression because that restricts me on what um, packages I can use. I just sample it and then build my models from that. Different R users have different typical shapes of data. Uh, Okay, so data sets could have tens, could have many rows or could have many columns. Uh, how does this frame perform various width and depth? Um, so as I mentioned that um, this frame, you can control a disk frame by the number of chunks that it has. So, uh, so n chunks, so yeah, this one would have um, uh, 168 chunks and this many rows and this many columns. And actually, because this frame uses data table in the background, roughly speaking, per chunk basis, it has the same performance characteristic as data table. So in this frame, the additional control you have is the number of chunks you can have. So per chunk wise, no difference to data table. Uh, so, so it's a question of how many chunks you have and how you efficiently manage the chunks. So, um, uh, yeah, so whatever the characteristic of data table is, it will inherit that. Also, you need to be careful about chunks. Um, that's my answer to it. Uh, 
just mine. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, please feel free to email them to me. I have my, I'll open up my email on another screen and I can see all the questions. So let me scroll back and see what other questions there are. Um, I answered the question about group by, uh, it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's uh, okay. When I just, as a question, when I just want to edit medium data, do operation on each cell, not summarize, how do I make sure the lazy changes are committed before saving the modified data set to a CSV? I cannot use collect, okay, yeah. So, and Raphael, so um, the short answer is, you just use the write this claim function. So actually, let's look at this one. Let's look at, oh. Um, I don't know what's happened. Okay, yeah. So if you remember, I have this 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 frame called this frame A. Uh, let's just look at the, how it looks like. I know in this one you can collect, so you can do you can do it like this. So, and I know your answer, your question is not to collect them. So say I want to multiply every column in A by two, and I want to make sure that I've done the right thing and save it somewhere else. This is what you can do. So you can go A one is equal to A, and I want to mutate the column A by time taken by two, okay? So that's, so A1 theoretically is disk frame A, but with column A multiplied by two. So how can I see that? There's a few ways. You can go head of A1. Yep, and you can see that it's already changed it um, from the one to two. Actually, just to show you, I, I, I know you, you don't mean to call collect, but because it's such a small data, yeah. You can see that it's done it correctly, or you can go A1, I want to look at the first chunk. That's usually efficient enough. Or you can look at the second chunk or the third chunk. Uh, it just so happens that it broken up a three row column, a three row there into three chunks, but, but you get the idea. It, um, it's basically, yeah. So you can check whether it's done the right thing. And once you've, you've done, you've seen that it's done the right thing by checking head or get chunk, you know, once that you've, you've ensured that it's done the right thing, then you can just go A1, write this frame and out path to .df or something. And maybe call it A2. Then, then you will have saved A2 to this new path and with the correct results. And you can check again, you can go head on A2. Yep, correct. Get chunk on A2, um, correct. So that's how you can check uh, that it's done the right thing. Uh, okay, I got the questions from, uh, from uh, Juliana on the, from Gmail. So uh, instead of answering the questions from the bottom up, I give some people that ask questions um, at the beginning. So is it possible to run this frame on GPU like NVIDIA? Uh, the question is where would data table and HTO fit big or medium? Actually, data table is completely in memory. So, so given that my definition of medium data is anything that doesn't fit into RAM, but fits on your disk. Data table technically is fits into the small data paradigm. Uh, but you can get computers, you can rent EC2 instances with four terabyte of RAM. So it's four terabyte small data, probably not. Uh, so, but anyway, that's my definition. So I'm talking about laptops and desktops. So yeah, uh, I'm not so familiar with H2O. I don't know what else it provides beyond data table. Uh, if it's got its own module for manipulating data, manipulating data on disk, then it's medium data. If not, if it only uses data table, it's small data. Okay, next question. Is it possible to run this frame on GPUs and NVIDIA? Um, I, 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 the, the, this frame doesn't connect to NVIDIA direct as such, but I believe you can do something like this and it will work. Uh, you can go uh, A to this and then you go C map. What am I C mapping to? Uh, I'm, oh, I'm going to C map this. I'm better off writing it here. So you can do something like this. You can, this is my disk frame. And I want to uh, maybe C map this. What do I want to C map this to? I want to C map this to, you know, some for each chunk. Uh, I want to, you know, convert it, convert to XGBoost format. You know, and then you know XGBoost 
X, X, X GPUs, uh, and then your GPU equals to true, something like that. Technically, this is not, um, technically this is not, this, this is not correct syntax, but you get the idea, you know? I believe in XGBoost, uh, I, I could be wrong in this actually. I believe in XGBoost, there's an option to let you run the models on GPU. So there's nothing stopping you from running that because this frame lets you run arbitrary R code, but does this frame use GPU directly? No, you have to use it through some other package, yeah. Is future applied like for each apply? Yes, except uh, I much prefer future because future detects all your global variables for you. So you don't have to say, okay, I wanna pass this global variable to the these other session. It detects them for you. I think long, long time ago when I used for each, you have to specify you know, exactly, I wanna use this package, I wanna use these globals, and it, it's passed to the other sessions. Uh, and when I started using future, I didn't have to. So that's how I got, I just kept using Future. It's probably the most popular system out there. And uh, I'm not sure if 4H has changed now that it can detect the global variables for you, but I don't, I don't think it has, but so yeah. Our next question, do filter subset always run in memory? Can it return a disk frame? If the, yeah, exactly. So it, yeah, as I mentioned, a disk frame can return a disk frame. So yeah, uh, A equals A times three. So if you remember A is a disk frame, that is, yeah. So if I add A1 equals to that, um, A1, A, you take A equals A times three, and you look at the type, you look at the class A1, it's still a disk frame, it's still a disk frame. It's basically just A, but with this instruction stored. Um, yeah, and it returns that. And A1 works exactly the same as A. Uh, you can collect on it. And if you collect on A, you see that, yeah, one column is multiplied by three in the other one, yeah. If you just call a disk frame, you only see its description and output, not the content. Is there a way to print the content? Yes. Uh, I've shown the head, tails, get chunk. You can use those things. Do source keep carry over from one chunk of code? Uh, I don't know what that means. Um, yes, so source keep only modifies the, the well, only modifies the, the column that it, only modifies the column that it that it's, uh, comes after. So for example, A source keep, it doesn't modify globally. It only modifies A, if you know what I mean. So, so, so this source keep, only affects is A. It doesn't mean that it affects everything. Um, so it affects every chunk inside A. But sharding changes the number of chunks, yeah, I've already answered that, it doesn't. If you have different sharding in two disk frame, do we get an error? Does it still do the job corresponding chunks? Okay, if you have, if your two, if when you, when you set merge chunk ID equals to true, um, yeah, and merge by trunk ID equals to true. It kind of assumes that you know what you're doing. So if you have a mismatching number of chunks, I don't think it throws an error. It throws a warning, but I have to check that. Uh, but I, I don't remember putting in a warning to check it. But the idea is the moment you, you do this, this claim assumes that you know that you know what, what you're doing. So you're meant to be doing this. So yeah. Questions about arbitrary section. Does it have to be a formula? Could it be a custom function? I'm thinking about calling heuristic net and doing something to it. CNN. Yes. Yes. Answer by others in the chat. Yes. Well, yeah. As I mentioned, the whole attraction of um, this frame is that inside this C map, you can do whatever you want. Um, any R package you can load, you can just do it here. So you can do it. Is there, is there a problem? The CSE reading behavior changes when the file reaches a certain size. Can you force behavior? Yes. You, you can force it to do whatever you choose, actually. But um, the problem is that um, the documentation is a bit dense. Um, so for example, you can choose things like, you can even choose what backend you use. If you don't like data table for some reason, you can just choose a backend equals a reader, and it will do that. Uh, you can do things like, you say, okay, you see how a function called recommend 
recommend n chunks? You said, okay, it will recommend like say 168 chunks. You said, I don't want that. I want 200 chunks. You can override that. Um, yeah, so it's everything. And also dot, dot, dot gets passed to the, to the reader. So if you're using data table, everything you put in a dot, dot, dot gets passed to the F read. If you're doing reader, the dot, dot gets passed to the, I uh, believe, read CSV. Yeah. So there's a lot of control over what you can do. Um, but uh, like for example, if I choose backend equals to data table, and I do chunk reader equals to read lines, in the logic, it might be doing something completely different. Actually, I think we're over two hours. Um, so last question. Uh, could there be an option to force second file to have the code class of the, the first? I read a lot of data where I don't know the type. Um, you mean automatically? No, but if you set the code, uh, maybe that's a good good option. So yeah, there's no there's no option saying you know follow the code class of first. You know equals to true. There's there's no option to do that. You kind of have to obtain the code classes of the first chunk manually and set code classes equals to whatever that you set, you know, something. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's, but I guess once you set code classes, the same code classes gets applied to every file you read. So um, that way it's, um, um, but yeah, there's no convenience function to do what you said. But uh, it could be an interesting thing. I don't see any other questions. Uh, or anything that's new, um, yeah. I guess join with Ms. Ch Mass Chunk could be useful in some. So yes, I mean it, it's kind of like the recycling in R. You know, it's useful for some things, but typically you don't want to do it. You know, like for example, this could be useful. I don't know for some use cases, but do you want to do that? Maybe. Uh, yeah, some clever algorithm want, probably want to do that. But anyway. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think I've gone just a little bit over time, but um, thank you everyone for attending. And uh, I believe this will be recorded. This was recorded and it'll be shared online. So yeah, and also, as I mentioned, any questions, feel free to go to GitHub and click on the, um, yeah, feel free to go on GitHub, you know, click on issues and ask a question. Uh, yeah, I try to be as re responsive as I can. And thank you very much for attending. Awesome. Thank you so much, DJ. This was really, really cool. Um, and yeah, just for everyone else, I'll send you an email through the meetup itself, like you guys received my emails of saying it was coming up and whatnot, with the link to where you can see the video, um, and also a short survey from USAR 2020. So keep an eye out for those. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, DJ. It was really, really awesome. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I guess um, that's it. Yeah. Have a good night or thanks. morning, everybody. Yeah, everybody. Thanks, wherever you are in the world. Thanks. Uh, I'll probably talk to you guys later. I'll yeah. quit now. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks.